Like a background tapestry, religion impregnates the life of Ethiopians from the time they are born. Most will never leave their small village. But for some, like Mimi, their destiny is to travel. An unexpected journey to discover the spirituality of her country and a trip to the heart of her memories. My name is Mimi Tadese. I'm 13 years old and I live with my mother, Lalibela. I wake up early every day and I eat breakfast with her. Then I go to school. When I come home from school, I help her straighten up the house. In the afternoon, I play with my girlfriends. We are on vacation right now and I don't have to go to class. Yudra Mikaela is Mimi's mother. Her husband died during the last war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. They live off a small pension that was granted to them by the government. She has only one male child, Yigeno, who became a monk when he was just an adolescent. Mimi and her father were very close. It's been four years since the last time she saw him but she still savors the nostalgia of those wonderful days when her mother would prepare breakfast for the three of them. She did it with the same ease and dedication as today. But now, the aroma of coffee doesn't fill the invisible space of the absentee who has left a subtle touch of sadness in the hearts of both women. Mimi never saw her father again since he was buried in a small town in northern Ethiopia, his birthplace. She was 10 at the time, and they did not want to take her to the funeral. They said that many people attended. Her father was a very communicative and friendly man who always carried a flute with him, a flute which a French soldier gave him in Djibouti. My father played that flute all the time. When I would listen to my mother grinding the coffee in the morning and my father playing the flute, I knew that it was time for me to get up. That flute disappeared with him. And Mimi never listened to either of them again. But Yigeno, her brother, promised that one day he would take her to visit her father's tomb. That day has finally arrived. My name is Higieno Tarese. I am Mimi's brother and live in a monastery that is close to Lalibela. I dreamed that I would become a monk and I came here to live. This is how it always happens. You dream that you want to be a monk and you leave everything behind to go to the monastery. Right now, I'm not working. I dedicate my time to reading the Bible and other sacred books. I pray in the morning and at night. In the morning, I have a light breakfast of legumes, and later, I join my fellow monks to help with some of the church activities, like harvesting barley or cleaning up around the temple. <laughs> Uh, 
አዝመራው እንዴ ነው ዘንዱሩ ይዘው ደሙዝ ካው ግምሽ ነበር ያምከብ ላይ ነበር ዛሬ ምስተኩል Lalibela was born to be the center of the world a labyrinth of temples excavated by angels to protect the faithful from the demons of Islam The traveling minstrels say that the king after a trip to Palestine was brought before the presence of God by these angels God asked the king to return to his homeland to build churches in a way that had never been seen before And so he returned and began to build During the day men worked and at night the angels did The final result 11 churches dug out of the earth like caverns for the birth of New Jerusalem With the help of the angels, the churches were built between the 12th and 13th centuries, and since then they have continued to be up and running. La Libella, its 11 main churches and the dozens of small churches and monasteries that surround it, was at one time the capital of Ethiopia and the center of the Orthodox Church. Even today, pilgrims from every corner of the Orthodox world come here, and on specific dates like the Epiphany, The city is overflowing with monks and the faithful who come to celebrate the holidays. There are about 30 monks living in this monastery, but not all of us stay here the entire time. One of our obligations is the pilgrimage, to visit sacred places. This is why so many monks are seen on the roads. During our time here, we collect fruit, sell it at the market and give the profits to the church. Aside from this, we don't do anything except pray and read the Bible. Monks only live for God. For centuries, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was the southernmost Christian church on the Nile basin. In the 15th century, all the Christian kingdoms of Nubia were swept away by the Muslims of the north. Only the Ethiopian church survived the burning. Its spiritual leader was an Egyptian appointed by the Alexandria Patriarch. Later, the Ethiopian Orthodoxy chose its own path as well as its spiritual leader. Aside from its singularity, the Ethiopian church has many similarities with other western churches. like the coexistence of a secular clergy whose ministers should be married and a regular clergy which bishops come from as well as its connections with Egypt the Ethiopian church has ties with the Jewish religion everyone believes that king solomon had a child with the queen of sheba and that this child menelik The Lion of Judea was the founder of the Solomonic dynasty. Other Jewish customs have been preserved, such as circumcision and the Holy Sabbath, Saturday as well as Sunday. Other features like the development of liturgical scriptures, the Ge'ez, are believed to belong to the Ethiopian church. In Ethiopia, religion is not an alien fact, but an everyday act. There is no act, desire, or movement that is not linked to the caprice of the saints. Mimi lives in the town of Lalibela. It's a small town. that did not have electricity until just recently. She has grown with the heat of life in the churches and her development revolves around the visits of monks and pilgrims. And due to the absence of war, 
Her life has also been affected by the incredible development of tourism. My best friend is Mulugetu. I go to school with her. I also have other friends like Waba, Melkam, and Nersani. But I spend most of my time with Mulu. She's in the fifth grade, like me. When there's school, we go together. And we are also together when they call us to water and work in the garden. In the afternoon, when school gets out, we skip rope. We play games, and we often go to sleep together. I told her that tomorrow I'm going to pick up my brother, and he's going to take me to visit my father's grave, just as he promised me. She's very happy for me. She knows how long I've dreamed of this trip. The Lalibela Market is held every Saturday. People come from all the valleys that surround the town. Contrary to what the stereotypes say, Ethiopia is not devastated by hunger. Its geography is exuberant and its lands are very rich. Ethiopia, among many other astonishing facts, is the African country where the most meat is eaten per inhabitant. The monastery where Yigeno lives is four hours from town. When King Lalibela finished his new Jerusalem with the help of the angels, he stepped down from the throne and dedicated the rest of his existence to a life of contemplation. However, his successors did not do the same, and rock after rock, tunnel after tunnel, new temples began to appear around the town, hidden from the eyes of the enemy of Christ. Just by looking at the precipitous and lush geography of the region, it was difficult to identify the many temples that were hidden underground and among the rocks. A complete liturgy of objects, books, and crosses, centered on the many churches and monks, appeared. Some are quite old, but have survived to today. On her journey, Mimi runs into two friends from school, who spend their free time selling reproductions of these objects to the tourists. Her friends walk with her for a short while, and then Mimi, on her own, continues the ascent towards the monastery where Yigeno lives. The first European to give a true account of this place was the Portuguese Francisco Alvarez. When he arrived at La Libela in 1524, he couldn't believe his eyes. Only contradictory facts existed about a city whose churches were built in the rocks, but nothing else. Alberis came with the intention of converting the Copts into followers of Rome, and he was truly moved by the strength of the Ethiopian religion. Neither Alberis nor any of the other Catholic missionaries who crossed Africa in search of the lands of the mythical Prester John were able to convince them to embrace the doctrines of the Catholic cross forever. It's not known for certain how these churches and temples were built or who constructed them. There are almost 200 of them scattered throughout northern Ethiopia. The people blend legend and history to the point of making it, like no other African area, a territory sustained by myth. Without myths, Without its ability to turn time into fables, Ethiopia would be just another country. This is not the first time that Mimi has gone to the monastery. She goes every two or three months to see her brother. The life of the Ethiopian monks shares some similarities with the Satus monks in India. 
They combine periods of retreat, and even the vote of silence, with others of openness, in which they make pilgrimages or accept a family visit. This time, Mimi walks up towards the monastery with the uncertainties of anyone starting a grand journey, a trip towards a re-encounter with the memory of her father. But they will not only go to their father's hometown. After visiting the cemetery, Yigeno wants to make a pilgrimage to different sacred places in northern Ethiopia, as well as to travel to Addis Abeba to participate in the Maskal festival. Mimi has never been to these places and is going to meet up with her brother with the assurance that she's about to begin a fascinating experience. Yigeno is already prepared to leave. Today, they will head for the north. This is a very important trip for me. First of all, because I promised this to Mimi, and also because it's the first time that I'm going to make a pilgrimage outside of the monastery as a monk. Years ago, when my father was alive, I went to Addis Abeba. He was returning from Djibouti, and I went with my mother to wait for him at the train station. I remember the long avenues, the buildings. Since then, I have dreamed about returning, but now I will be attending the great Maskal festival. But beforehand, I have to ask for the blessing and advice of the abbot of the monastery. Remember that there are two places that you have to visit. First, you must go to the Lake Tana monasteries. And in the second place is the Maskal festival. Pay close attention to how the tree burns. This burning tree represents the return of Christ. Don't forget to pay very close attention. To head towards their father's town, Mimi and Digeno have to go down the steep, craggy rock upon which the monastery sits. It's a half day's walk among rocks that have been molded by the hands of man for centuries. An immense work of traditional engineering based on stairs, twists and turns that give way to sacred caves. La Libela is a magnificent Swiss cheese made to suit the tastes of the saints. Ethiopia cannot be considered commonplace. Once we have tailored it to fit our thoughts, Ethiopia bursts through the seams of reason again. It's the only African country that was never colonized by a European army. The Italians tried for years, but had to give up. Ethiopian culture is original, very different from the rest of the African nations a culture more than 2,000 years old, but shaped based on exchanges, on contact with Europe and the Orient for centuries. A solid reality, a defined personality as the sum of the world, cultural blending as an example of survival. My father supported me when I said that I wanted to become a monk. He didn't like the war, but our grandfather was a soldier, and forced my father to join the military. He didn't want the same thing to happen to me, for me to have to go places that I didn't like. I remember the day that I told him about my dream. I thought that he was going to get angry, but he started to laugh. First, he asked me if I was sure. Then he went to get his flute, and he began to play. I cannot remember that day without the flute. When he came back from the war, he never talked about the deaths. He only sang songs and he always appeared with a new one. Listening to him, I could never imagine that war could be so terrible. I never imagined that one day he would stop playing and that I would never see him again.
B. Now we're going to Gondar and Lake Tana, just as the abbot told me to. The festival in Addis Ababa is still a few days away. And I think we have time to do this, okay? Okay. But first, we'll go visit a monk who lives close to here. And also, the castles. Does that sound good? Okay. You know, they're not going to let you into the temples at the lake. We will visit our father's brothers, and you will stay with them while I visit the temples, okay? Fine. <laughs> On their journey to Gondar, Yigeno wants to visit a famous holy man who, like the Hindu Sandus, abandoned his home and family to dedicate his life to the ascetic life. He lives isolated from the world and only leaves his place of retreat to make a special pilgrimage. The holy man is taken care of by his followers. Every day they make his injera, the sourdough pancake-like bread that Ethiopians need to survive. It's made out of fermented teeth, a grain that can only be found in these lands. The dough is cooked like a grilled pancake with a little bit of butter. But this man chose a very special path as an ascetic practice. Inspired by a dream, he decided to carve a church out of a rock the way they must have built the ancient churches. There were three ways to build a church. Some were excavated in a rock jutting out of an appropriate crag. Others took advantage of a natural cave. And the most spectacular ones were separated from the central monolith to isolate it from the rest of the rock. It was that monolith that was used to build the temple. The holy man, to build his, took advantage of a great rock and worked in front of it. And he didn't lack a thing. He even managed to get some of the mural paintings that are so typical of Orthodox Ethiopia. These paintings reproduce biblical scenes and the lives of saints in a style between Gothic and naïve. Mimi and Yigeno continue their journey towards Gondar. Going in this direction, it's more common to see many falasha. Ethnically and linguistically identical to the Amaras who dominate the country, the falasha are not very sure of the origin of their Jewish faith. Some people contend that they are the true lost tribe of Israel, the direct descendants of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. The truth is that during the 1980s, when drought devastated their region, 10,000 of them were evacuated by air to Jerusalem, leaving the rest in a miserable situation. When the rains are benevolent, the region where Gondar is located is rich, surrounded by lakes and fertile lands, which at one time was the crossroad of the three great caravan routes that passed through this part of Africa. Gondar was the perfect place to install a capital, a city that would dominate these vast lands. And this is what it was like from the middle of the 17th century and for more than 200 years, the most splendid years in the history of Ethiopia.
Gundar was called the African Camelot. That brilliant court made churches and small palaces grow like feverish poppy castles whose origin is unknown. The Dervish Sudanese in the 19th century and the British bombardments during the middle of the 20th partially destroyed the structural integrity of the constructions. They did not manage to ruin them completely, but turned them into splendid skeletons. According to the chronicles of the time, the courts that occupied this part of the city lived well and dressed in sumptuous robes imported by the caravans coming from the Far East or the desired Europe. They used Chinese dishes, Venetian glassware, spices from Ceylon. In luxury and magnificence, the castles of the Ethiopian Empire had nothing to envy the European courts. The emperor was God and no expense was too much to bring man closer to divinity. The most spectacular of the many castles built in Gondar is that of King Fasiledes. Later on, his son and successor, Johannes, did not want to create a new capital, as was the custom, but limited himself to adding a lavish library to his father's church. During the time of Jesus the Great, the church of Debre Burhan was erected lavishly adorned with golden panels and detailed works of artisanry. The murals represent the Trinity, the crucifixion of Christ, the fight between St. George and the dragon, and other biblical legends crowned by the famous ceiling of angels' faces. In one corner of Lake Tana, the Spanish Jesuit church of Pedro Paez is found. This man, born in a town of the province of Madrid, was the first European to identify the sources of the Blue Nile in 1618, long before the official discoverer, the Scotsman James Bruce, did so. Paez went to Ethiopia with the intention of bringing the Negus Empire back under the control of Rome. He was a polyglot. He learned to speak Amharic perfectly and read Ge'ez fluently. He was an intelligent man and a great conversationalist. He was able to get close to the emperors, who were not blind to the desire of getting close to the Catholic doctrine. One of them, Susenos, ordered him to build a wonderful two-story church palace, something never seen in Ethiopia up to that time. He did it, but he never saw his work completed. He died leaving as a legacy many books about Ethiopia and a church, which the earthquakes have taken care of destroying little by little. Since my father died, I have not seen my family. His two sisters, Sama and Nuria, are a true grandmothers. They raised my father until he met my mother and left for the military. 
I have never seen two women cry as much as Sama and Nuria the day that my father was buried. And I will never forget that day. I will never forget the sound of the dirt falling upon his coffin. I have never heard anything like it. If death sounds like anything, this is the sound, a dry and empty knock of earth on wood. Mimi and Yigeno's grandmother died very young, during the Great Famine of the 70s. During that time, the drought killed hundreds of thousands of people. Some died of malnutrition, and others, like the mother of Sama and Nuria, of an epidemic caused by the accumulation of cadavers in the streets. Ethiopia is a rich country, and this should never have happened. It happened during the final years of Emperor Haile Selassie's reign. The harvest suffered from the drought, and speculators hoarded grain to provoke higher prices. It got out of hand, and the emperor did nothing to stop it. Shortly afterwards, the communists seized power and ended the reign of more than a thousand years of Ethiopian kings. Lake Tana is the largest lake in Ethiopia and one of the most important geographic landmarks on the planet. The Blue Nile, one of the arms of the mother of all rivers, emerges from its basin. This is one of the first places that the abbot from the monastery asked Yeheno to visit. There are 36 islands on the lake. 20 of them are inhabited by monks, who are the guardians of the churches and monasteries, some of which date from as far back as the 13th century. Women are not allowed to enter. Yigeno wants to visit the Kebran Gabriel Monastery. To get there, he must get a papyrus canoe. They cannot be rented. He has to buy one. They are single-use canoes and are very cheap. They are the same papyrus boats used along the Nile since the times of the pharaohs. The fishermen of the area use these canoes to capture species like the Nile perch. The canoes last for two months and then they are discarded. In 1770, the Scottish explorer James Bruce declared himself the official discoverer of the sources of the Nile, branding Pedro Paez, as well as other Jesuits who saw the Nile before him, as impostors. Today, there is no doubt that Paez was the first European to write about the lake, knowing the geographic importance of this spot. He went there accompanied by the Emperor Susenius, and in his book he wrote, I do not feel capable of expressing what I feel while observing what Cyrus, Alexander, and Julius Caesar so desired to see. From Lake Tana, the Blue Nile tackles a slope of more than 2,000 meters until reaching the plains of Sudan. There, in Sudan, it joins the White Nile, and from there they flow together until falling into the Mediterranean Sea. There are 1,450 kilometers to Hurtan, crossing gigantic slopes. 
The lake is considered the source of the Blue Nile, but in reality, it comes from the small Lake Abbey and the thousands of streams that feed the Tana. The Quebran Gabriel Monastery, built in the 17th century, is found at the highest part of the island and is surrounded by a stone wall. The church has a circular structure, very typical of Ethiopian traditional design, in which the walls are made of mud and compacted with straw. The origin of these monasteries in the middle of the lake goes back to the historical intention to hide the works of art from the enemies of Orthodox Christianity. From the beginning, it was proved that Lake Tana was a safe place, and little by little, not only the treasures of the church, but the tombs and jewels of the crown found safe refuge here. And as in all the churches of Ethiopia, mural paintings occupy a place of honor. They are colorful, vibrant, and difficult to interpret for the non-Orthodox. Their objective is just as with Gothic painting, to teach the uneducated about the lives of biblical characters, a mythicized and reinterpreted life in a literary manner. Life at Quebran Gabriel is peaceful, and most of the monks spend years here without ever leaving. Abba Hali Mariam, a monk who resided here until he was 90, spent 25 years here without finding a reason to leave. Wrapped in his white cloak, he could be seen for hours on end sitting next to a stone or meditating under a tree. His only worry, like all the monks at Quebran Gabriel, was not to contradict the ways of God. When there are no ceremonies, the monks of Quebran Gabriel work in the gardens of the monastery where they get most of their sustenance. The novices do leave the island and sometimes go to the nearby town of Bahardar where they purchase the things that the earth does not provide. Quebran Gabriel, like most of the Ethiopian churches, keeps a replica of the Ark of the Covenant, the chest in which Moses kept the tablets of the law. According to legend, the Queen of Sheba was from Ethiopia, and after a trip to Jerusalem, she became pregnant by King Solomon. Her son, Menelik I, founder of the dynasty that remained in power until the 20th century, also traveled to Jerusalem. He lived with his father for a few years, and when he returned, he brought the precious treasure with him. Since then, they say the Ark of the Covenant is found in Aksum, near the border with Eritrea. Once a year, they bring it out in procession. No one can see it. It's covered by a cloth and is guarded again without really knowing for certain what is found inside. The death of my father meant a big change for everyone. He never spent a lot of time at home, but his presence was constant. We always talked about him, of the stories that he told us when we were younger, 
and of the adventures that he experienced during the war. Mimi spent the most time with him when he came to La Libela. She would be speechless and her eyes would light up when listening to his stories. In a way, it was my father and his stories that provoked my desire to become a monk. He did not want to be a soldier. My father knew thousands of stories, and in reality, what he really wanted to be was a jongleur, a minstrel traveling from festival to festival, telling his stories. He told us that one of our ancestors was a jongleur of the king, and he accompanied him on military campaigns as well as his spiritual retreats. That king, it seems, was a very devout man who had churches built like this one. The king regarded him so highly that he granted him the position so that his descendants could inherit it. This is how it was until my great-grandfather stopped playing and took up arms since he was the griot of Menelik II. My father died in the war as a soldier, but in reality, he was a jongleur, a man who loved life. As a monk, I feel close to my father, close to the life that he would have liked to have lived, a life of searching, dedicated to God and the souls of all men. At the monastery, we spend a lot of our time meditating or reciting verses from sacred books. Sacred books are written in Ge'ez, the predecessor of Amharic, the language that is spoken throughout the country today. Ge'ez is a kind of Ethiopian Latin, and its first inscriptions date back to the first century of our time. The first Bible was translated into Greek, but it was not until the 13th and 14th centuries when the golden age of literature of the Ge'ez language flourished. Many books were translated into Arabic, producing new writings that would later become the sacred books of Ethiopian Orthodoxy. Among these books you will find the Kebra Negast, whose author is unknown, and one which praises the glory of the kings. It is the great national epic poem. There is also a sophisticated collection of legends, which highlights the story about the Queen of Sheba, Solomon, and the Ark of the Covenant. In these and other legends, starting with the biblical characters, the Ethiopian writers have contributed to the myth in order to adapt to the desires of the Ethiopian kings, who wanted to be direct descendants of the kings of Israel. At the Ethiopian monasteries, whether a monk or not, a traveler will always receive a piece of iñera and a glass of water. Yigeno's journey continues, and there is a long stretch that remains before he reaches Addis Abeba. On their way to Addis Abeba, Mimi and Yigeno approach one of the greatest natural wonders of Ethiopia, the Tisisat waterfalls. 
Pedro Paez and James Bruce, as well as the first Portuguese who saw these waterfalls, described them with such astonishment as someone confronting a supernatural landscape. They fall over a stretch 400 meters wide and plunge 50 meters down. Smoke of the Nile is what the natives call this place, a poetic name and one profoundly close to reality. Because smoke is what the millions of minuscule particles of mist rising over the crest of the mountain appear to be. Mist that has created a perennial microclimate jungle around the falls. Only the Victoria Falls on the Zambezi River can compare in beauty and majesty. Addis Abeba is like one of those African capitals created to confuse the visitor. It's noisy, frenetic, dilapidated, but it also possesses an internal rhythm that invites you to stop, one that does not drive you out with dusty threats. The city possesses an invisible order that is difficult to decipher. It's a city of mixed cultures, sitting at the foot of the mountains and overflowing with churches, markets, and fantastic tree-lined streets. More than just a city, Addis Abeba is a meeting point, the beginning and the end of all journeys. The festival that Gijeno and Mimi want to attend has already begun. It's the Mascal Festival, just one more among the numerous excuses that Ethiopians use to continue renewing the myth each year. It's the everyday celebration of life and death, like the two faces of one moon. Mascal is a festival that celebrates the rediscovery of Jesus Christ's cross every year. It tells about the legend that was spread in the year 326 when Empress Helena, mother of Emperor Constantine of the Roman Empire, found the wooden cross, the cross that was used to crucify Christ. The Empress had converted to Christianity in secrecy long before her son. This is why she is not only considered a saint under Christianity, but also the patron and protector of the Order of the Knights of the Temple, the Templars. One of their most important missions during the Middle Ages was to protect the Holy Cross. The objective of the Empress, however, was to find the location of the Holy Sepulchre. According to legend, she was unable to find it on her own which is why she prayed to the smoke of an incense bonfire, which led her to the location of the cross. At the height of the division of the Coptic and Orthodox churches during the Middle Ages, 
the Patriarch of Alexandria gave half of the cross to the Ethiopian Emperor Dawit. According to the stories, the idea of St. Helena was to take the cross to the Christian kingdom closest to Jerusalem in order to keep it away from the battles of the Crusaders. Since then, one half, the crossbeam, remains under the protection of the Coptic Christians in the monastery of Santa Maria, 70 kilometers from the city of Dezi. During the festival, the people decorate the streets and homes with flowers, mostly yellow daisies. The celebration ends with the burning of a great pyre of aromatic flowers that represents the renewal of time. Because in Africa, in the eternal Africa of myths, death does not exist. Death is nothing more than an invention by man which renews time in order to continue seeking out life. Yeah, 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 yeah.